Looking at gases and the gas law, there, there is more than one gas law, but there's only one that we need to know about at this stage. So before we talk about uh, the gas law and some specifics about gases, let's look at why gases exert pressure in the first place. Now, this is something that you need to be able to explain to your examiner. So I think the first thing we need to do is to recall what pressure is. And hopefully you'll remember that pressure is the force on a unit of area. So our equation, pressure is force divided by the area over which it is being applied. So for example, if you are a 40 kilogram person, you would have a weight of, let's say G is 10, just for simplicity. W equals mg, that's your weight, 40 times 10 would be 400 newtons. So there's your force. Now, if you are standing on, let's say, uh, a very normal flat soled shoe, a trainer maybe, it might have a, a surface area of maybe a uh, hundred centimeters squared. So you would have 400, your pressure would be 400 divided by 100 would be four newtons per centimeter squared. If however, you were standing on stiletto heels, really high heels, really small heels, then that area might be one centimeter squared. And so your pressure then would be 400 divided by one, which would be 400 newtons per centimeter squared. So that's what pressure is. It's a force on an area. So if we think about uh, a box containing some gas, oops. Then for there to be a pressure, there must be a force. So what's happening if you were to look at one wall side on, you would see the gas molecules collide with the wall and bounce off. So there's where your force occurs. So what's happening is the gas molecule, in order for it to bounce off, the wall must apply a force to the gas molecule Remember, and this is a beautiful link back to some of the other work you've done. Remember Newton's laws, Newton said that everything remains at rest, not moving, or in a state of constant motion, unless there is a resultant force acting. That's Newton's first law. Newton's second law said, if there is a resultant force, there will be an acceleration. That acceleration being proportional to the force. Now, he also said uh, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So, this gas molecule 
is accelerating because its velocity, which was to begin with in that direction, ends up in that direction. So there is a change in velocity because it is changing direction, which means that there is an acceleration for this gas molecule, which means there has to be a force from the wall to cause that acceleration. The wall is pushing on the gas molecule to make it go backwards. Now that, of course, if we just look, our first law said the thing will remain at rest or in a state of constant motion, moving towards the wall at a constant velocity, unless acted on by a resultant force. But it isn't remaining in constant motion, it's changing direction. So there must be a resultant force causing the acceleration. And we know there's an acceleration because the velocity changes direction. Even if it doesn't change size, it does change direction. Now, that means there has to be a force on the gas molecule. And by Newton's third law, that means there must be a force of the gas molecule on the wall. There's our force, which causes the pressure acting on the area, which of course is the wall of the container. So gases exert pressure because they collide with the walls of the container or you know, whatever else they're colliding with. The gas molecules in the air are colliding with you right now and exerting a force on you and therefore there is a pressure on you, atmospheric pressure. So that is why gases exert pressure because Pressure is the force on a unit of area because those gas molecules are colliding with the walls and changing direction, which means they are accelerating, which means by Newton's first law, there must be a resultant force. And that is the force of the wall on the molecules, which means there must be a force of the molecules on the wall. That's how you get your force. The wall has a surface area, so as gas molecules collide with the walls of the container, they exert a force. and pressure is force over area. So that is the statement of why gases exert pressure. This is the explanation based on Newton's first, second and third laws as to why that happens. Now, this is your sort of grade nine explanation, say eight, nine. There is another level to this where we bring in momentum, but whilst you don't have to be able to do this to answer questions about, about gases, making those connections between what we're talking about with gases and what we have talked about in terms of forces and also momentum that's really important. That really helps you pull the whole subject together. So try to make those connections. So we have what pressure is, why gases exert pressure. Let's look then at the gas law. So if we take a fixed mass, this is controlling the, the variables we're going to have a fixed mass, literally the same number of grams of gas molecules throughout here. So if our mass is fixed, what can we measure or change? Well, you would probably come up with the idea of volume. We can measure the volume of the gas. We can change the volume of the gas. We could measure and change the pressure 
of the gas. And of course, we could measure or change the temperature of the gas. So, we could, for example, fix the volume change the temperature and measure the pressure. So let's say, for example, I take a sealed container and I heat that container and I measure the pressure of the gas inside the container as I change the temperature. What would we expect to happen if we were to take a sealed container of gas, let's say, for example, an aerosol, and we were to heat it, as you know, a, a deodorant can. If we were to heat that, what would we expect to happen to the pressure inside? Well, of course, we would expect, as the temperature rises, the pressure would rise. This is a thing not to do, by the way. I'm sure that uh, lots of people have told you this. Uh, you don't heat sealed containers of gas uh, like this because they explode and uh, do a lot of damage. So don't do that. We could, of course, fix the pressure. We could change the temperature and measure the volume. So if you were to heat a gas at constant pressure, let's imagine you have a cylinder and you have a piston which is free to move and I heat the gas, what's going to happen? I've got atmospheric pressure pushing here so the pressure is constant, it's always atmospheric pressure. What's going to happen to the volume of the gas as I heat the gas at constant pressure? Hopefully you can say that as the temperature rises, the uh, volume will rise, the gas will expand. And of course you could fix the temperature You could change the pressure and measure the volume. So if I was to increase the pressure on a gas, making sure the temperature doesn't change, if I increase the pressure, what will happen to the volume? If I squeeze a gas, what happens to its volume? Well, as the pressure increases, the volume decreases. So, those are experiments you can do. This is the one that we are particularly interested in at GCSE. So let's look at that then. So if we change the pressure, measure the volume, control the temperature, well, what we expect is as the pressure rises, we expect the volume to fall. What happens? Well, that's exactly what happens. What we find is that the pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. That is to say, if I double the pressure, I have the volume. We have an equation then, that is to say, the pressure equals some constant over V. To go from proportional to equal, there is some constant that goes in here. That should be a familiar process to you. Or you could rewrite that, I'm going to write this in red, that pressure times volume is a constant. And I will put a box around that. 
Aga sats on kuulnud. That is your gas law. Let's look at some scenario, some particular situations which help us to embed our knowledge, our understanding of how gases behave. So let's take a scenario where a gas in a sealed container is heated and consider what happens and why. Well, we know the pressure increases. Why is this? Well, when you supply heat, you're supplying energy. And that energy will either be potential energy or kinetic energy. Increasing the kinetic energy, given that the average Ke is a measure, or the temperature is a measure of the average Ke. Then you supply heat, you supply energy, you increase the kinetic energy, the average Ke, so the temperature increases. So what? Well, that means the molecules are moving faster. Which means they will collide with the walls more often. And each of those collisions will involve a greater force on the walls. So both of these things increase the pressure. And let me just explain a little bit more about that. This is your sort of grade nine level explanation now. So don't switch off. That's the kind of level we're talking about. We know that the pressure is as a consequence of the force the gas molecules exert on the walls. And pressure is force divided by area. Now, we know that the resultant force is the change in momentum per second and we know that momentum is mass times velocity. So if they are traveling faster they have more momentum so your molecule comes in with a momentum mass times velocity and in a perfect world it will come out losing no energy at mass times velocity momentum. So you have a change in momentum of 2mv. So clearly if V is bigger, then the change is bigger. So each molecule will hit the wall with a greater force because it has a greater change of momentum in that collision. But also, there will be more of these collisions every second because they're traveling faster and so they will collide more frequently. So the total change in momentum per second, combining the number of collisions per second and the force each collision or the change in momentum that each collision uh, involves, means that the force increases. So that's why when you heat a gas in a sealed container, 
the pressure increases because the walls aren't going anywhere. They're not moving out as they will do in a later scenario. So because the molecules are traveling faster because you've given them some energy which has become kinetic energy of the molecules, because the average Ke is increased, the temperature is increased. As a consequence of that, they're moving faster, which means they will collide with the walls more frequently and each collision will involve greater force because resultant force is about the rate of change of momentum. And because momentum is mass times velocity, the bigger the velocity, the bigger the change in momentum. And because they are colliding more frequently, there'll be more changes per second. Scenario two then. When a gas is heated, but the pressure can't increase, the gas expands. So let's have a quick diagram of that, just to picture what's going on. So we have our cylinder. And the cylinder has a piston, if you like, a movable wall, which is absolutely free to move. It has no friction between the walls of the cylinder and its edges. A mythical frictionless piston. So we have atmospheric pressure pushing on the outside here and at the moment we have atmospheric pressure in here. So we heat our gas and as before the Ke increases so the temperature increases since temperature is a measure of the average Ke of the molecules. So that means the molecules collide more often with greater force. With the piston, or on the piston perhaps would be a better way to say that. So what happens? Pressure increases. So the piston gets pushed out. Moves to the right, so the volume increases. Now, since the volume is increased, then the molecules are not going to collide as often as they were before because they have more volume to move in. There will be fewer collisions with the piston. So the pressure falls back to atmospheric pressure. That's the process. You heat, average K increases, temperature increases. So you have, like we had in the previous scenario, more collisions per second on all of the walls, but this one can move. And each of those collisions involves a greater force, greater change of momentum. So that pushes the piston out. But when the piston moves out, the volume is increased, which means the number of collisions per second falls so that 
the pressure goes back to where it was before. So that's scenario two. Let's look at scenario three then. When a gas is compressed very rapidly, it gets hot. Now this particular scenario is mentioned in the syllabus. So if you're pumping up the tire on your bike, if you do it in a hurry, you find the end of the pump gets hot, or at least warm. Why does this happen? Well, let me show you another example of this. This is a fire piston. And what I've got here is some very fine, dry cotton wool. I have a thick walled transparent cylinder, thick plastic walls, and a plunger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my little bit of very dry cotton on a dimple on this prominence here. This is very tightly fitting over this so the gas can't escape when we squeeze it. So you can see the thick walls there hopefully. The plunger likewise, the piston, is very tight fitting. So when I squeeze the gas you see the cotton wool actually burst into flames. So what's happening here is when I squeeze the gas I am doing work on the gas of force times a distance, right? So that is a change in energy. That's increasing the kinetic energy of the gas molecules. But because the temperature rises really rapidly and because these walls are thick, preventing the thermal energy leaving, or at least dramatically reducing the rate at which it leaves, the temperature in here gets very high, high enough to cause the cotton wool to burst into flames. This is actually how a diesel engine works in principle. In here you've got some air and diesel vapour and the piston comes up inside the engine, squeezes that fuel air mixture really rapidly, which makes it really hot, and the diesel vapour ignites, causing uh, a force driving the piston back down again. So, that is what's going on when you squeeze a gas very rapidly. So, work is done on the gas which leads to an increase in kinetic energy of the molecules. So temperature rises since temperature is a measure of average Ke. Now the reason we talk about it being rapid is because if we didn't do it rapidly, if you imagine your, your piston, if you did it very slowly, then as the, the gas rises in temperature, the thermal energy would dissipate, key term, out of the size of the cylinder. So if you did this really slowly, you could squeeze the gas if these walls are conducting. You can squeeze the gas at a constant temperature. And this is actually what we did with Boyle's Law. We would move the cylinder in, or the piston in, really slowly. We would move it and we would wait until the temperature had fallen back to room temperature. Then we'd measure our pressure and our volume. 
Scenario four, the gas being allowed to expand rapidly, it gets cold. You might think, I, I don't have any experience of that. I think you might find you do. An aerosol, there's supposed to be no in there. For example, a, a deodorant. So picture the scenario where it's a nice warm morning. Let's take an even more uh, extreme example. Let's say uh, it's been a really hot day. It's 30 degrees outside. It's been 30 degrees for quite a long time. And uh, you've just taken a shower and you're going to use your deodorant. When you spray your deodorant, which remember is at 30 degrees because it's been sitting in that 30 degree heat for uh, for a long time. So it's, it has acquired the temperature of its surroundings. It is at the same temperature as the room. So when you spray that on and it feels cold, it's because it is actually cold. But how can it be cold? It was at room temperature. Let me show you uh, a little video of, of that. So what I've got here, this is a thermal image of an aerosol. And you see the aerosols at about 27 degrees or thereabouts. And here's my finger coming in to press the button on the top of the aerosol. This is the front of the aerosol, this is the nozzle. Watch what happens. <coughs> Do you see that? When I pressed the button and the aerosol gas came out, look at the contrast between the temperature around 20 degrees and the temperature that it was before it came out, 27 degrees or thereabouts. So when the gas expands, it cools. This is a rapid expansion, of course. We could do it slowly, not with the aerosol, but we could do it slowly. And this wouldn't happen. But it does happen if we do it rapidly. So, what's happening? The gas expands against atmospheric pressure, remember, now if it's going to do this expanding, it's applying a force over a distance, you know, it's going to go from this to this. For it to do that, it has to push gas molecules out of the way in the atmosphere to make room to expand. So it's doing work. It's applying a force over a distance. So work is being done. Now you know work is a change in energy. That's what work is. But we're not giving this gas any energy. So the energy that it is converting in doing the work to expand against atmospheric pressure is the energy it has already. So since we can't get something for nothing, conservation of energy, total amount of energy remains the same, it just gets moved between stores or converted between types. So some of the gases, kinetic energy, becomes potential energy as it expands. So the average Ke, if some of the Ke has now been converted to Pe, the average Ke falls, so the temperature falls. That's why when a gas expands rapidly, it gets cold. This is the opposite, of course, to the previous scenario where we compressed the gas rapidly. We did some work, we gave the gas some energy, which increased its average kinetic energy so much it got hot and the cotton wool caught fire. This is the opposite. We are allowing the gas to expand against atmospheric pressure, which means the gas is doing work. 
The energy that that work represents comes from the gas. The gas is kinetic energy. So the gas is kinetic energy falls, the average falls, just means the temperature falls. And that's why it feels cold. Because it is cold. One final thing to show you, just uh, out of interest more than anything else. This is a micro scale vacuum kit. So I have a, a chamber which sits on a, a base with a nice tight seal on it. And what I'm going to do is take some water, as you'll see, I've got a turkey thermometer here, 50 degrees. So the water is not anything like hot enough to boil at atmospheric pressure. But what I'm going to do is take some of that water, put it into the chamber, and I'm going to reduce the pressure inside the chamber by pulling the air out through this tube using the syringe. So there's a little container of that water at 50 degrees. And as I reduce the pressure, you will see condensation forming on the inside of the chamber. Consider why that is. More of the water molecules are leaving the surface and condensing on here. That's because the atmospheric pressure pushing down, keeping them in place, is falling. So the amount of kinetic energy they have to have in order to leave the surface and not come back is falling. And it comes to a point where the average kinetic energy of these molecules is such that they've all got the energy to leave the surface because the pressure has fallen so much. And you can see in there, the water is boiling. And yet, when I let the pressure back up to atmospheric pressure, do that slowly so I don't fire water all over the place. You can see it's not boiling at atmospheric pressure, but it was boiling at the pressure inside the chamber. I tried to show the temperature here was the same, but the turkey thermometer needs to be totally immersed. And obviously this volume is too small for that. So that's an example of a liquid becoming a gas. The reason the liquid is a liquid right now is because it doesn't have enough energy on average for those molecules to leave the surface. The most energetic molecules are up here, of course, the ones with the most energy. And you will get some evaporation from here for that reason. So the most energetic ones leave, which means the average energy falls, which means the temperature drops. If I drop the pressure, then Molecules with less kinetic energy than before can now leave. And if I keep dropping the pressure, that's why I got the condensation here. If I keep dropping the pressure, eventually all of these molecules have got enough energy to leave. And so the, the liquid boils. 